this part of the presentation will be in, in English. Um, I'll just give you a brief introduction of uh, Nova Discovery. Uh, thanks again both uh, Madame Grosset and Adriano for the, uh, the talks, uh, which will largely resonate with what I'll be presenting. Um, I'll, I'll probably start with um, a, a personal uh, story. I don't have any uh, scientific background. I've actually started my professional career as an investment banker. Um, in London and then in Tokyo. And when we started the company in 2010, I knew at the time very little about the industry. There are uh, two key facts, uh, data points, that really struck me and convinced me that modern and simulation was the way forward to support the uh, emergence of a new paradigm for drug research and development. Uh, the first one is that the entirety of drugs developed since the birth of the pharmaceutical industry in the late uh, 19th century were discovered on the back of only 500 therapeutic targets. The human body contains tens of thousands of potential targets. This basically means that we're just in the beginning and there's a huge um, uh, field that has not been explored yet uh, for lack of the right tools to investigate in a cost and capital efficient manner uh, new potential targets. Uh, the second data point uh, was um, uh, the following. If you look at the average spending of the pharmaceutical industry as a whole globally, in terms of percentage of sales, it's 18%. This is, by a large margin, the most R&D intensive industry in the world. The second uh, in the ranking is actually uh, aerospace, and they are at 6% of sales. But, interestingly enough, the conundrum is that out of all those extremely R&D intensive industries, the pharma was, and is still today to a certain extent, the only industry which had not yet invested strategically into modeling and simulation to help improve uh, the productivity of their processes. So, putting back to back those two data points, when we started to work on the project with Jean-Pierre, I was actually uh, absolutely convinced that um, modeling and simulation had a future in supporting the emergence of a new paradigm. What I probably um, uh, was not expecting was how hard it has been uh, until the last couple of years, uh, let's say from 2010 to 2015, to educate, disseminate, and, uh, and make things change. And certainly the Avicenna Alliance has been extremely uh, helpful, uh, a lever to push for change, and certainly policy development going forward will also be critical. So anyway, um, without further ado, stepping into the presentation itself, so NOVA is uh, specialized in in-silico clinical trials, uh, which is still today an emerging field of, of expertise, and, and certainly emerging is the operative word here. Uh, it took two and, a, uh, two and a half millennia uh, for the randomized placebo control trial design for in vivo phase three to establish itself as the gold standard uh, from the first controlled experiments uh, 500 years before our era to the uh, landmark piece of legislation by the FDA in 1962. So basically it took a long time. When I'm saying that in silico clinical trials is an emerging field of expertise, I'm certainly not expecting Nova Discovery to be around in 2000 years. So we actually need things to change faster this time around. Uh, the good news is that in this digital age, um, things are indeed moving faster. Um, regulatory science is emerging. I won't spend too much time on this uh, as it was uh, brilliantly addressed by Adriano's presentation. Maybe a couple of additional comments. Uh, out of the eight strategic priorities of the FDA nowadays, four are directly linked to the use of modeling and simulation. Uh, we've briefly mentioned uh, the ethical aspects of being able to profile optimal responders to ensure that you don't enroll uninformative patients in your in vivo trials. There's, of course, the vexing issue of rare diseases where you basically don't have enough patients in order to produce statistically significant results in terms of ev evaluating the efficacy of your product, uh, as well as the importance of real-world evidence in the sense that those phase three trials uh, will last on average three years, but you might want to know how the drug will behave uh, over a period of 10 years. The only way to do this in a prospective manner is to basically use modeling and simulation. There's also an important element, uh, which is the learn and confirm paradigm. I'll, I'll spend a bit more time on this in a, in a couple of slides. I'll, I'll 
skip or, or go briefly through those uh, current challenges with the uh, conventional way of uh, designing in vivo trials. So again, profiling responders so that your uh, trial is targeting the right patients, transposing trial findings into real-world evidence, uh, exploring uh, the optimal duration for the trial, the optimal drug regimen, and in some particular instances, and uh, one of which is uh, immuno-oncology, the mesmerizing number of clinical trials you would need to finance if you were to explore on a systematic basis all the pairwise potential combinations of targets. There are nowadays about 30 targets identified in seven different tumor types. Uh, this basically results in 6,000 phase three trials we would need to finance collectively if we were to cover all of this ground, which is evidently never going to happen. Uh, so modeling and simulation can help in uh, selecting those uh, target combinations which show the most uh, promise. So model-informed um, research and development really is about being able to predict in silico by computer simulation, uh, by combining a mathematical model of a disease and a drug with virtual patients, the clinical benefit that you will expect at the end of your in vivo phase three. So it really is about de-risking decision-making. Am I really going to embark on a costly and uh, time-consuming phase three trial which is properly designed? Am I capturing the right responders? Uh, it's about uh, reducing time and costs. For instance, in silico can help you cover a, a wide array of potential uh, assumptions, uh, much faster and much cheaper than would otherwise be the case with more conventional assays in vitro and in vivo. But the key message is that it's not something that should replace those conventional assays. It is something that should be used on a systematic basis before each of these conventional steps in order to better inform their design. So I'm, I'm not saying here that in 10 years time, uh, in vivo phase three trials will have disappeared and will only be testing uh, drugs on computers. This will never be the case but in silico it should be used on a systematic basis before each of the key steps of developing a new drug. Um, as well as the, the learn and confirm paradigm, so this is something that is uh, a terminology that is actually being used by both agencies, so the FDA and the EMA, and this is the, um, basically what, what I was explaining, uh, the fact that in silico should tie with in vitro and in vivo so that a virtuous cycle kicks in where the model informs decision making for in vitro and in vivo assays and in turn the results of these assays comes back into the model to inform and improve its predictive capabilities. So not a substitute but certainly something that should be used on a systematic basis. Uh, in terms of applications, modeling and simulation can virtually serve a research program from the earliest days, uh, the earliest step being am I looking at the right target uh, down to um, selecting the, uh, optimizing the trial design, identifying biomarkers and translating evidence into the real world. So it really is a decision support tool that should be used throughout the entire process. Now, as far as Nova is concerned, our WISE platform, uh, standing for White Box and Silico Engine, consists in four building blocks. Uh, the first and most important layer is the effect model methodology, which I will uh, give a brief overview of in a couple of slides. This is a methodology that was discovered and developed by uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Boissel. I, I say uh, a couple of words about Jean-Pierre at the end of the, uh, my presentation. Uh, we've also had time to uh, design a series of standard operating procedures to uh, cover all the aspects of our modeling workflows uh, at NOVA, and we have two major building blocks in our technology platform, Git Health, which supports the knowledge management aspects of things, which will be presented by Jean uh, after my speech, and the simulation framework, which really handles all the uh, algorithmic and simulation aspects, which will be introduced by Bastien. Uh, the in silico project workflow, uh, without going into too much details, a couple of key messages here. This is a standard workflow that we apply whenever we work with um, a pharma or biotech partner. Everything needs to start with an extremely good understanding of the problem at stake and the questions the model will need to address. Uh, this sounds like something extremely obvious, but believe me, uh, you can very quickly be embarked on a project where you're tasked with modeling cancer 
If this is the question, you can probably spend 100 years and 70 PhDs full time. You will never finish the model. So everything starts with a very specific understanding of the question the model will need to address. Then Git Health will serve to help our biomodelers identify in the scientific literature all the information, all the knowledge relevant to describe all the biological mechanisms implicated in the disease that we need to model. Simwork, again, the algorithmic uh, version, will also be developing uh, virtual populations. This is where we use uh, accessible data. So the, the, the disease really is primarily based on knowledge extracted from scientific, scientific articles, whereas data is used for virtual populations. There is a stringent model validation procedure. Um, this is evidently something absolutely critical to uh, foster adoption by non-experts. Um, among other things, the FDA has published uh, a first guideline on model validation procedures for dossier submissions last year, specifically focused on the medical device space, but they're in the process of converting this guideline to drug research and development. Now, fortunately enough, uh, there was an 80% overlap between the FDA's guideline and our own standard operating procedures, so kudos to Jean-Pierre for this. Uh, and then once the model is finally validated, then we start the simulation runs in order to answer the questions we were asked. We provide the answers to our partners and then we loop, we start the loop, this virtual cycle between in silico, in vitro and in, in vivo, where basically the model gets refined over time as new data emerges from those conventional assays. This is an extremely important point that I need to make. There's a lot of hype these days around machine learning applications in life sciences. Inflated expectations kill entire industries. And I read uh, more often than not blog posts on LinkedIn, for instance, about CEOs from those machine learning companies saying we're going to revolutionize uh, the way we treat cancer patients, for instance. Well, it's going to be a bit harder than this. And again, those people are really conveying messages that I doubt they'll be able to deliver on. So this is almost epistemological uh, rather than merely te technological. There's a difference between models being developed on the basis of data only and models developed on the basis of knowledge carefully extracted from the scientific literature. In, in the first instance, you are in a correlation paradigm. In the second, you are in a mechanistic paradigm. In other words, you carefully map all the biological entities involved in the process of interest and the functional relationships linking those entities. Now, using data, only data as the base material for model modeling purposes has a number of, of uh, inescapable limitations. The models are based on, on correlation, uh, which uh, it doesn't give any indication about the underlying causal links. Uh, the second point is that the data, in, in especially in biology, are extremely time and context dependent. So in other words, if you were to use as a base material to develop a predictive algorithm data collected on Caucasian profiles five years ago and try to apply the predictive algorithm to a different context, a different geography, at a different time point, there's a, a strong likelihood that the model will not be predictive. Um, Moreover, uh, I won't go through all of the limitations, but suffice to say is that in terms of adoption of modeling and simulation by non-experts, those operate as black box algorithms. Hence the white box we chose to describe the way we see our platform. Our platform is fully white box. Uh, people, non-experts in modeling and simulation can actually trace everything in the system uh, so that it's um, a more both more tangible and, and amenable to being used by, uh, again, those, those non-experts. So I guess <coughs> the key message is not throw away all the machine learning approaches and all data-driven models are bad. This is certainly not the, uh, the point I'm making here. Uh, what I'm saying is that in order for these approaches to deliver on their full potential, they need to be supplemented by mechanistic-driven approaches. So we view this as being complementary approaches rather than exclusive from one another. Now for the ethic model, which really is the, the conceptual foundation of the, uh, the approach the company is promoting. This is how we manage to predict uh, clinical benefit in silico uh, potentially years before the first uh, human trials. It's a very simple uh, two-step process. We start by 
applying the model of the disease to a population of virtual patients so that for each of these virtual patients we will have the probability or the risk of suffering from the clinical event of interest so whether it's uh, tumor progression, uh, death, stroke, uh, really depending on, on the question at stake, without the treatment, the RC, the control. Uh, then we add the drug submodel into the disease model itself, apply this back to the same patients, and this time around we get the risk of the clinical event of interest modified by the treatments. So for each of these patients, the expected clinical benefit is just the arithmetic difference between those two probabilities. So for the first time, in terms of uh, the emergence of a new paradigm, we are in a position to convert the notion of drug efficacy, which has been so far something extremely qualitative, into a quantitative metric. And this quantitative metric, in turn, will serve our optimization exercises. Whenever we're being asked by a partner what is the optimal dose for my product, the answer will be driven by the application of the effect model in the sense that the scenario maximizing the number of prevented events will determine the optimal dose. So if you sum all of these absolute benefits for each virtual patient over the, um, the virtual population, you'll get this population-wide efficacy metric, the number of prevented events. This is a visual representation of the effect model where you have on the x-axis, the probability of suffering from uh, a long graft uh, rejection without the treatment. And on the y-axis, the same clinical event, but this time around, modified by Everolimus, which is a drug that has never been tested in vivo in the prevention of long graft rejection. This is an in silico clinical trial that I'm, I'm displaying right here. Now, thanks to the effect model, you can see that graphically, those patients here, those who are sitting the further away from the line bisector, which basically corresponds to the area where the patient would be indifferent between receiving the treatment or not, there's no, uh, no uh, efficacy derived from the treatment, those patients here are the optimal responders. So when we say that we can help our partners in selecting the right patient profiles ahead of their phase three, we're specifically talking about looking at the profile these patients share, and those will be the optimal responders, so that then we can ensure our biotech and pharma partners enroll the right patients to maximize the efficacy of their trial. And interestingly enough, this also translates, mechanically speaking, into potential savings, because you won't need as many patients for the same level of statistical significance. And the last point I want to make on this slide is that this project was financed through um, an FP7 program. This is actually the first European research grant the company has secured, and we were fortunate enough over the years to have a Eurostars. Uh, we had a, a Horizon 2020 last year, and we filed for a large Horizon 2020 project called In Silico Clinical Trials, which we'll be hearing from soon, hopefully, over the, uh, the summer holidays. Uh, so just before I um, uh, pass over to Jean for the presentation of um, uh, Git Health, uh, I'll, I'll turn now to, to French. Uh, je tenais à remercier alors à la fois évidemment l'équipe de Nova qui non seulement fait un super boulot en ce moment, uh, mais comme toute start-up, on a passé des moments qui n'étaient pas très faciles. Tout le monde s'est accroché, vous avez été extraordinaire, donc bravo messieurs dames. Et je voulais aussi remercier Jean-Pierre, sans qui uh, tout ça serait absolument impossible. Jean-Pierre Boissel, qui est donc cofondateur et directeur scientifique de Nova Discovery. Jean-Pierre déteste les panégériques. Je vais quand même passer deux petites minutes pour vous expliquer un peu en quoi euh, cette personne est extraordinaire. Euh, il a successivement été à la frontière d'innovation dans le secteur. Euh, je ne peux pas toutes les passer, ça prendrait trop de temps, mais il y en a certaines qui m'ont marqué. Il a publié la première méta-analyse en Europe. J'aurais peut-être des approximations et tu m'en excuseras, mais euh, ça pour le coup, j'en suis sûr. Euh, il a fait installer le premier ordinateur dans les sous-sols de l'université Claude Bernard. À l'époque, c'était, je ne sais pas si c'était déjà des IBM, mais qui prenaient à peu près 100 mètres carrés, qui fonctionnaient avec des per cartes perforées pour faire des additions et des, et des soustractions. Euh, il a organisé, me semble-t-il, le premier essai multicentrique où les données étaient collectées directement euh, auprès de chacun des centres en utilisant une technologie de pointe qui permettait de transmettre des paquets de data par des lignes téléphoniques, le Minitel. Quand Jean-Pierre a présenté ça dans un congrès aux États-Unis au début des années 80, on l'a pris pour un martien. 
euh, et dix années plus tard, euh, Internet euh, commençait à émerger. Il a été instrumental aussi dans la promotion et l'émergence du design des cliniques randomisées contre placebo, ce qui lui a valu quelques tomates pourries euh, auprès de médecins dans des congrès à l'époque où euh, ce design-là n'était pas encore un gold standard. On l'accusait de donner des morceaux de sucre et des placebos à des patients et donc de tuer des patients. Donc il a, il a vécu pas mal de combats. Euh, et vraiment Nova Discovery est, je trouve, l'incarnation de ça, à la fois de cette résilience, et c'est en partie pour ça que je remercie l'équipe, euh, et le fait aussi qu'on peut avoir 10 à 15 années d'avance sur tout le monde, et si on tient le coup, on finit par avoir raison et par gagner. Donc voilà, merci beaucoup à tous, et je passe la parole maintenant à Jean.